In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Christ is in our midst. He is and never shall be. You have to be loud, because there's only three of you. And how many out there? One million watching? Our live stream now? Four? Seventy? Twelve? Who knows? It doesn't matter because God is always watching. You know what? I was thinking about that a little bit. Like things are so different right now. Things feel weird and strange and we're making adjustments and accommodations. And, and it just feels weird in a way. But, but God is always there. Always ministering to us and we're always seeking to bless him. Um, no matter how many people are here. Although, I mean, you know me. I want the whole world right here in this nave with me. I mean, I want to tear out the walls and have everyone you know, right here, known by name, known that they're loved. Well, this is one way of having the world in the nave, I guess. I want to comment a little bit. Just, to, just I, I feel like we have to, while we're in the midst of this season, to, to keep commenting a little bit on what's going on. We're in the midst of a really strange season. And I first want to acknowledge again just how peculiar it is to everyone. Living in the midst of a pandemic is un unlike anything many of us have ever experienced. Sometimes it seems surreal. Sometimes it feels like we're living in a dream. Is this really going on? And then sometimes it seems all too real. All too real. And I think, especially for our healthcare workers, who are out there. I think they ex really experience both sensations on the same day more than many of us do. I see that this current state of things has affected lives profoundly. And I want everyone who hears my homily today to just hear me acknowledge that this thing that is going on is affecting your life. It's affecting our lives profoundly. It's affecting our consciousness. It's made a, a world that has been shrinking, a shrinking world, seem even smaller in a way as this has spread and become a global issue. And it's been resulting in a strange common experience for people around the world. As Christians, we continue to pray as we always have. We continue to beseech our Savior to have mercy on his world. We continue with a radical trust in God's providence, believing that he is in control. We believe that he is in control. It's significant for us that we're experiencing this during such an intense time of prayer and fasting. And I think we should undoubtedly capitalize on the time of prayer to believe in the effectuality of our prayer for the world. It's also a season of repentance. That's significant. Coinciding with this pandemic. And we acknowledge that all sickness is the result of sin. It's the result of the corruption that we've introduced into the world. All sickness is. All suffering is. We know that we've become subject to corruption. And that we're responsible for it. And I believe that this is one of the prompts for the great fear that many experience. I think this is why in the midst of the great faith and hope that we have, then we also re respond by embracing serious repentance. My fear is that we would much rather regret the consequences of our decisions rather than prevent the consequences to begin with. It's like the old, you know, ask for forgiveness, not permission. But we don't have to live with such shame. 
And it's time for a paradigm shift. World, <laughs> all three of you, and the world. It's time for a paradigm shift, world. It's time for us to care before it's too late. And to be con become convinced of what we truly need. I mentioned this at the beginning of the season, and I hope it's been a theme for you throughout this season. Although we didn't catch it on tape that time. I gave a little tiny homily during one of our pre-sanctified liturgies in the first week of Great Lent. And I reminded everyone that we should set out with the understanding that Christ is enough. Christ is enough. And I continue to exhort you to meditate on this proposition and ask yourself if you believe it. Do I believe it? That Christ is enough. In the midst of comfort, do I believe that Christ is enough? In the midst of impending doom, do I believe that Christ is enough? In the midst of the realization, ultimately, when it comes down to it, that we don't know what the next day will hold, Christ is enough. That's my obligatory reflection on the pandemic. I think we need to keep hearing things like this because it's just invading our lives and it's molding us. We need to be more molded by Christ more than even by what's going on around us. And that's not to live in denial about what's going on around us. Like I said, we pray and we repent in the midst of what's going on. Loving this suffering world that we live in. Getting on to the themes of Great Lent. We've already discussed, and I feel like we, we have to and we can discuss at great lengths, the merits, the joys and the wings that come from fasting. Fasting is this blessed antidote to our first transgression. We know that fasting from certain foods troubles the impulses. It brings lightness to those who would take such a holy prescription seriously. And has proven endlessly, endlessly in the life of the church, in the life of the practitioners of faith, that when it's coupled with prayer, which is the only appropriate manner, when it's coupled with prayer, Fasting turns the soul of the person who prays into a haven for compunction. It turns the heart of the Christian into a noetic firmament, a spiritual heaven. The fathers of the church teach such things as these. If you rule over your mistress, that is your stomach. If you rule over your mistress, every place of residence will give you dispassion. But if she rules over you, you will be in danger everywhere. We come to understand that no matter where we are, what we're deprived of, no one, no circumstance, not even the greatest criminal or debater or tempter or humiliator, not even the great deceiver can steal from us what is most needful, such as the awesome power of fasting to those who no longer want their souls and bodies to be fettered with the heavy lethargy of hopelessness and complacency. If you want to overcome hopelessness and complacency, take these prescriptions seriously. We could endlessly discuss the miracle of self-deprivation in this way. It is awesome. It's both fearful and wonderful. But there's more. There's more, isn't there, than just fasting. Fasting isn't only about food, but there's something deeper, something more. One can fast and fulfill the measure of the letter of this most blessed prescription, and we should try to. But let's continue to delve deeper into the human condition. 
to our origin story and even our own experience of sin. And I think that we'll come to this conclusion, and this is my main point for today. Obedience is life. Disobedience is death. I've chosen to preach on this topic today. Obedience is life. Disobedience is death. Specifically because it's the Sunday of St. John Climacus. It's the Sunday of St. John Climacus. You may know about this man who lived in the Sinai wilderness in the late 6th, early 7th centuries. He was a simple, obedient monk at the monastery who later became a hermit. He was known to be humble and wise. He did not consider himself special or suited to offer anything of value to others. But at the request of a friend, also named John, out of obedience, this friend John asked him to write something down. And so our St. John of today, of Sinai, wrote what he could. And the resulting book is one full of such wisdom that it's become among the most read books in human history. It's called The Ladder of Divine Ascent. This appellation given to him, Climacus, St. John of Sinai, also most famously known as St. John Climacus, means ladder, Climacus, of the ladder. So we call him St. John Climacus. He's properly St. John of Sinai, author of the ladder. We call him St. John Climacus, St. John of the ladder. Each of the 30 chapters is likened to a step or rung of a ladder leading to heaven. The first being on renunciation of the world. You can't ascend to the Creator if you love His creation more than Him. And the final rung is concerning the linking together of the Supreme Trinity among the virtues, the linking together of faith, hope, and love, integrating them into one's person and becoming a whole person. And the lengthiest chapter in his book, step four, on blessed and ever memorable obedience. Obedience. This is not a popular topic, obedience, unless your kids are annoying you. And then, and then all of a sudden it becomes at the top of your list. And it's like, what book can I, Amazon.com. What book can I read on obedience? But when it comes to obedience to authority for us, for example, obedience to one another, who needs it unless I get something out of it? That's often how we act. That's consumeristic and that's not humble. That's not a Christian way of acting. And so we need to work on correcting that. An inquiry into the orthodox way of life will result in the quick discovery of the value given to obedience in the Christian life. Going back to our origin story, that of our first parents, it's often been mentioned that the first transgression was the failure to fast. Self-indulgence led our first parents to partake of the tree which they were instructed to avoid. But the act itself was one of disobedience. A free act of disobedience resulted in the condition of humanity. Therefore, the antidote to death-bearing disobedience is life-giving Obedience. See, the millions of people were saying it out there too. Life-giving obedience is the antidote 
to death bearing disobedience. Truly, we've inherited this uh, propensity towards self will. It's a result of desperate attempts to control what, what we cannot control or what should not or need not be controlled. And I think as, as hard as we try, as much as we grind our gears, we know that it doesn't work. But the solution that the problem is, the quandary is the solution is an answer we don't want to hear. Obedience is a tough sell. Disobedience, motivated by self-will, isn't a matter of playing games with God. As if God will fall in and out of favor with the people he created to either love or abhor. We continue to emphasize the freedom endowed to humanity that provides the ability to be obedient or to disobey. And while the topic of obedience isn't a particularly appealing one, especially to those of us in the Western world, its implications are so deep and transformative. I hope that in hearing some of today's words, you will respond with a greater shift in your personal paradigm. I have to say that this week, as I was contemplating this topic, I started to experience the singe of my own ego. It caused me to realize that there's so much more work to be done for me to understand what it means to be obedient, to die to myself, to truly serve and love and to be humble. It was troubling. It was troubling. I realized I'm not that obedient. Kind of brought tears to my eyes. Something needs to change, and it's not too late. It can. To lay the most solid foundation, and to give you some quotations, give you some quotations far more beautiful and meaningful than anything I can say. A few quotations from Scripture first on obedience. Think foremost of the witness of Christ. We see in, in him the model of obedience. And he said, I can do nothing of myself. I can do nothing of myself. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of my Father who sent me. And he also put it so clearly that anyone who would be his disciples, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. It seems that the biblical witness would be enough for us to know that we simply have to mortify the self-will. But also quite precious is the the Christian witness to this life of obedience and what it looks like and how it's to be lived. And so I want to share some words from the latter of St. John of Sinai. First, in his chapter on obedience, he who has renounced self-rule entirely Obedience to self isn't obedience, okay? <laughs> it's to the other. He who has renounced self-rule entirely, even has reached the end before setting out on his journey. For disobedience is distrust, excuse me, for obedience is distrust of oneself in everything however good it may be, right to the end of one's life. I mean, look at these powerful words on obedience. And I'm, I was inspired to share a little bit of a longer quote from St. John. Just let these, these beautiful words 
soak in as I read them to you and meditate on them. If you have within you the power of him who said, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. If the Holy Spirit has descended upon you with the dew of purity as upon the Holy Virgin, if the power of the Most High has overshadowed you with patience, then like the man, Christ our God, gird your loins with the power of obedience. And having risen from the supper of stillness, wash the feet of the brethren in a spirit of contrition. Or rather, roll yourself under the feet of the community in spiritual self-abasement. At the gate of your heart, place unsleeping guards. Restrain your unrestrainable mind within your active body. Amidst the actions and movements of your limbs, practice noetic stillness. That's quiet prayer of the heart. And most paradoxical of all, in the midst of commotion, be unmoved in soul. Curb your tongue with which rages to leap into arguments. Seventy times seven in the day wrestle with this tyrant. Fix your mind to your soul as to the wood of a cross. Be struck like an anvil with blow upon blow of the hammers to be mocked, abused, ridiculed, and wronged without being in the least crushed or broken, but continuing to be quite calm and immovable. Shed your own will as a garment of shame and thus be stripped of it. Enter the practice ground. Array yourself in the rarely, rarely acquired breastplate of faith, not crushed or wounded by distrust toward your spiritual trainer. Check the reign of temperance. Check with the reign of temperance the sense of touch that leaps forward shamelessly. By meditation on death, bridle your eyes, which are ready to waste hour after hour looking at Netflix, YouTube, Fox, CNN. Okay, St. John didn't say that. He said, bridle your eyes, which are ready to waste hour after hour looking at physical grandeur and beauty. Still your mind, over busy with its private concerns and thoughtlessly prone to criticize and condemn your brother or neighbor or spouse or child, I add. By the practical means of showing your neighbor all love and sympathy. By this, all men truly know that we are disciples of Christ. While, if while living together we have love for one another. Come now. Come and dwell with us. And for living water drink derision at every hour. That means accept criticism without immediately feeling like you have to defend yourself. Which so many of us do. It's hard to overcome it. I failed yesterday at it, I think. For David, the psalmist, having tried every pleasure under heaven, last of all said in bewilderment, Behold now what is so good or so joyous as for brethren to dwell together in unity. But there's no place for pride in unity. What do we want? I'll tell you, we really want each other. And we really want God. Something's got to give. A couple of more from St. John. Short ones. The really obedient man often suddenly becomes radiant and exultant during prayer. For this wrestler was prepared and fired beforehand by his sincere service. The ever memorable fathers, the fathers of the church, laid down that the way to humility and its foundation is bodily toil. 
But I would say obedience and honesty of heart because they are naturally opposed to self-esteem. That means esteeming oneself as greater than others. The fathers state that the active life consists in two virtues of the most general kind, fasting and obedience. And rightly, because the first destroys sensuality and the other reinforces this destruction with humility. And finally, prepare yourself for your set times of prayer by unceasing prayer in your soul, and you will soon make progress. I've seen those who shone in obedience and who tried as far as they could to keep in mind the remembrance of God. And the moment they stood in prayer, they were at once masters of their minds and shed streams of tears because they were prepared for this beforehand by holy obedience. If we live a life of obedience, it enhances our life of prayer, our drawing near to God. Try it this week. Just try to let that criterion be there in your mind. In what way can I be obedient to God and the other? I guarantee you that if you're seeking to discern in which ways you can and should be obedient, you will get stung with multiple realizations <laughs> that there's much to do. It stings all the more when you don't want to do it, but the glory is all the greater. The reward, the godliness that comes from the descent into humility that leads to exaltation. We can see how obedience is demonstrated in the life of Christ and that it's commanded by Christ. It's extolled and revealed as most effective at overcoming sin in the writings of St. John Climacus. It's equally extolled throughout the inspired writings of the church. Obedience is seen as a greater accomplishment than many forms of spiritual and ascetical acts. Because at the core, it's motivated by overcoming selfish desires in order to do the will of the other. We have failed to do the will of God, having been manipulated into thinking that our motives and desires are more trustworthy than God himself. We act as if our motives and desires are more trustworthy than God himself. So what are we to do? We're to respond to this terrible illness by trusting Him, by trusting God. Obedience is death to self and active trust in God. How is this applied to our lives? In the simplest of ways, really. By putting an end to selfish conceit and vain desires by seeking every opportunity we can to do the will of the other person, to do well for others, to give heed to the God-given conscience when it motivates to proceed in any act of goodness, to proceed in any act of virtue, in any act of prayer, to obey, I would say, means to heed the innate desire for union with God and neighbor at the expense of our personal freedoms and impulses. To obey means to put an end to selfishness and to let love reign. To obey is to acknowledge that quality is far more important than quantity Five minutes of a prayer, of a prayer in accordance with a rule prescribed by a spiritual father is far more beneficial than hours on end of self-motivated prayer. To become obedient is to welcome humility. 
And to welcome humility is to open the door to discernment. Recall that this is not a game. Obedience is not a game God's trying to play with. Not hoops we try to jump through in order to get to heaven. See, I did it. Forget about that. No one needs that. We don't need manipulations. It's about death to self in order to become alive in Christ. Christ, who sought not to do his own will, but the will of the Father who sent him. Beloved Christians, brothers and sisters, let us, who claim to long for union with God, use this most precious means that he's made available to us. We should seek to hear and apply to our lives all that we receive in the Gospels. When we seek to hear and apply into our lives all that we receive from the Gospels, then we will never tire of reading them and seeking to conform ourselves to the Gospel teaching. We should listen to those in authority and trust them, especially those who are inspired by the grace of the Holy Spirit especially the saints who provide such rich guidance and instruction. We should listen to the God-inspired hymns of the church. Let them reveal us as a spotlight seeking a criminal who would rather remain in the shadows. That doxasticon for the orthros was like that today. Oh my Lord, have mercy. Let us not seek pleasure in food and drink, but in heaven. That's like, for me, that was like a spotlight on a criminal. You caught me. Okay, fine. <laughs> Let us be caught in this light and revealed right away. And in our relationships with one another, let us consider the requests of those around us as gifts from God, revealing opportunity for us to do His will. Hear the voice of your spouse as the voice of God calling you to drop what you are doing and to arise to active love. Hear the cry of your child as the moment to arise from your introspection and to bestow life into a firm purpose. Let your work even, let your work even become a laboratory for blessed obedience in seeking to obey God and to serve others. Beloved ones in Christ, the possibilities of realizing this awesome antidote to death-bearing disobedience are endless. The possibilities for us who would seek out to live a life of obedience really are endless. With a bit of trust in God and an ounce of humility, sanctity can be born, holiness can be born, and the order of fallen nature overthrown by blessed obedience. Remember, obedience is life. It brings life. It teaches love. Disobedience is death and separation. At every opportunity to do well, let our mouths utter these, this simple phrase, may it be blessed. May it be blessed. I don't want to, but may it be blessed. Or, I think I'm really good at that, but may it be blessed. Let our mouths utter this simple phrase, may it be blessed. And God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen.